Good morning. Good morning. Welcome back. Father, thank you that we get to gather um, once again as a family, and we pray that you would strengthen us from a distance. No, not really. We are so glad to see one another, even up close at all. And we pray that you'd bless the time that we share here, Lord, that you'd bring honor to your name. We trust you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, before we get going, I want to mention a couple things uh, about what's happening. As you know, we are flexing with the needs of our culture. This is not a bad thing, by the way. Uh, exercise and being flexible and being taught how to worship in different ways and at different times. This isn't bad. It, it clarifies our thinking, makes us realize what we're really here for and why we gather, when we gather. Uh, it has not been a bad exercise for us. We are very grateful that we are able to meet in three services, and uh, we thank you for your prayers as we, as we move forward. Um, just so you are aware of it, we are not passing an offering. Uh, the little uh, agape boxes are back there, and that's where the prayer requests go as well. The prayer ministry is going on, and it's expanding, and so please put the prayer requests in the boxes back there on your way out, but we don't pass the little, we're not passing anything with our hands these days in an effort to keep each other healthy. On Wednesday evening, we will have Bible study in this room, and uh, Pastor Kelly will be starting a uh, series in 1 Samuel, which is basically God choosing a king after his own heart, and it's a wonderful book. We're going to do it with our preaching team over the next few months. So Wednesday evenings, and you don't have to sign up for the Wednesday evening service. We're not worried about overfilling it. We're trying to stay in the 250 zone because that's what we've been asked to do. But Wednesday night, there shouldn't be a problem. Men's prayer breakfast will happen on Friday morning at uh, 6.30, and we're going to do it outdoors because it would be a little too crowded for the number of guys that usually come in the fireside room at this time, we've figured. So we're going to do it outdoors. So those of you guys who are involved in that, spread the word. Uh, we're going to do that, that as well. One thing we would like, would you please pray for and perhaps be involved with our youth ministry, fifth grade and below. Fifth grade and below. Because they do a thing in the summertime called dog days of summer. What they mean is hot dogs. Okay? They make hot dogs for the kids. And they need cooks and they need people to help around the edges. So if you're not afraid uh, to help out in those ways, um, we appreciate it. Get a hold of Debbie through the... Uh, through the website or on the phone and uh, pitch in if you can. Uh, I think that's about it. Let's all stand together. Take a moment thanking the Lord in your heart for what he's done and how he's regathered us. Heavenly Father, we love you so much. We thank you for the work of your spirit within us. And we pray that you would gather our souls and hearts together as we worship you. We know that you hear us as one voice before you. And we thank you for that. We pray that you would fill us as we worship and praise this morning. And that you would cultivate our hearts in a world that is so dangerous. We pray for our culture. We pray for our country. The, uh, the struggles, the violence, the fear the anger that is erupting across our country, not just because of COVID, but also because of the recent violence that we've seen. We pray, Father, that we would be a voice for the gospel of peace within this world. And that as we lift our voices to you this morning, you would grant to us the ability to hear your word when we enter into it <clears throat> and receive comfort and strength and guidance from you that we might represent you well in this world. So once again, Father, we thank you for drawing us here. We thank you for your goodness to us, and we lift our voices to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please remain standing for, for this first song, and then Skylar will tell you when to sit down. <laughs>
Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where streams of abundance flow. A blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say.
God, Jesus, set our hearts towards you, that every eye would see you, a lifted high, a King of heaven come down, King of heaven come now, let your glory reign, shining like the day. King of heaven, rise up, who can stand against us? You are strong to save in your mighty name, King of heaven, come. King of heaven, come. King of Worship. 
strength is failing The end draws near and my time has come Still my soul will sing your praise unending Ten thousand years and then forever stand with us on this last one. Father, we thank you that you are holding on to us more tightly than we could possibly hold on to you in Christ. Thank you so much for your love, Lord. And thank you for the hope, the strength that comes with speaking and living in the truth of the gospel. 
We live in a darkened world. We're very aware of that. We see the violence in our culture. We see the worldwide pandemic. We see the fear. We see the anger. We see the frustration. And so, Lord, we look to you. And we thank you for your grip upon our lives, for the truth of the gospel, for the light that shines into the darkness. And we want, Father, more than anything, to live in that light, to live lives that reflect your glory and confidence in you in the face of even opposition in various ways. We do pray for our country. We pray deeply and profoundly for our world, that you would let the church speak the gospel across the cultural barriers and bring peace. Let there be revival in the land. Let there be a good work of your spirit, gracious and true, and help us to be a part of that voice, Heavenly Father, not just in this country, but in other countries as well, where we have representatives, where the body of Christ is represented around the world. And we thank you for the ability to gather and to worship you and to pray and to get into your word and to be refreshed and strengthened by the truth. So, Father, open our hearts, we pray. We, we trust your word. We trust your spirit to work in us <clears throat> as we meditate on it together. And we thank you in advance in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated if you'd like. And if we have any youth ministry folks with us, they can be dismissed at this time. Um, good to see you all again. Hey, amen. Amen. Um, you didn't know that those guys came to church, and you look at them, and you go, hey, now I see you across the crowd. Um, and do you like the first-class legroom and coach? We, uh, we took out half the chairs to come so that you wouldn't breathe on each other when you're singing. Um, it is good to be back together again, and it is good to be reminded as Christians of the true priorities of the kingdom. God knows what he is doing. The word of God is very clear, and we live, as I mentioned in our prayer, and as you're very aware, we live in a, a culture that where the fallenness and the, and the danger of the culture is just so abundantly clear. But that's why we as Christians draw close to the Lord. That's when we come to his light. You know, he, he dims the lights of this world. When the light of this world, which is a kind of its own made fluorescent light, is really, really bright, you don't think about eternity. But when the world looks hopeless and disheveled and angry and fearful, then the light of eternity shines much more brightly. It might interest you to know that all through history, Redemptive history, as you go through the scriptures, whenever God dealt with humans, he was coming into a dark place with light. Whether it's in the old covenant or the new covenant, whether he's creating Israel out of nothing through Abraham and his seed, and then protecting them in Egypt, and then delivering them from Egypt and, and destroying a portion of the Egyptian overlords and, and meeting them at Sinai, at every point, and, and then from there to Canaan, where they drove the darkness out of Canaan, every point, it's a confrontation between light and darkness, and at every point, there is opposition to it in the world, at every point. And yet God continues to speak, he continues to work, and he will win. And that is what we must remember. He knows what he is doing. In the new covenant, the ministry of Jesus comes into the world, God in the flesh. And in John chapter 1, what does it say? That he's the light. In 1 John, what does he say? That he's the light in where? In the darkness. Sometimes Christians, when they look around at the world, they, get, um, they begin to despair. And what I would like to encourage you is that <laughs> there's no reason to despair. When things are dark, that's when the light shows the most. And in fact, what you find is that precise issue, that precise thing, in Acts chapter 4. Open up to Acts chapter 4. We are in a series in Acts, and it's a great place to be with our culture the way it is right now. For Christians to be reminded of the first 30 years, the first 30 years, that's Acts, the first 30 years of the church's life, 
A brand new work of God poured out, his life poured out through Jesus Christ onto sinners, and he redeems them, and he fills them, and he strengthens them, and he creates among them and through them an entirely new living organism called, well, Jesus said, this is my church. These are my people. This is my gathering. He said it in Mark chap, I mean, uh, Matthew chapter 16. He pours his spirit into these people because he died for our sins, came back from the dead, was raised and seated at the right hand of the Father, pours forth that which you see, Peter says in Acts chapter 2. If you've been following along um, with the internet material that we've been putting out, you know that that work of the Lord, I mean, the angels were watching this. Acts chapter 2, the angels are watching this. The angels are saying, look at that. A bunch of stinking sinners are turning into these living spiritual people. Look at this. This is amazing. You know, the angels long to look into the gospel. First Peter chapter 1 says that. So this miracle is happening, and, and, and it's light in the darkness. I kid you not. Jerusalem had crucified the Messiah not that long ago, within the last few months, probably by the events that we're going to be seeing here in Acts 4. Israel had crucified the Messiah. There's no darker deed ever done by humanity than the crucifixion of the Son of God. And as a result of that, a brand new sunrise, a brand new work that no one, even the angels, didn't dream of what was going to happen when the Lord came back and then ascended to the Father, and then pours forth this life, and now the light begins in Jerusalem. I mean, if you looked at the earth at the time of Acts chapter 2, it, it went from the darkest moment in all of human history, the crucifixion of the Son of God, to the brightest, most amazing light when God pours forth his Spirit on a bunch of people who killed Jesus not 50 days before. And he pours forth his spirit. He forgives them. He, he gives them this new life. They begin to share their lives. with It's just marvelous. It's wonderful. It's just amazing. And it's what's happening. It's what's happening in the world. What's happening? It's what's happening in the world today. I kid you not. And the angels are amazed. The people of Jerusalem are amazed. But you read the end of chapter 2 of Acts, and it's like, wow. Everyone loves it. The, the folks in Jerusalem, even the ones that aren't Christians, are saying this is a good thing what's happening to these folks. And the Christians, they're, they're on fire. You know, they're like, wow, this is wonderful. We've been forgiven. Uh, the Lord loves us. Uh, we're walking with him. We're representing him. And um, in chapter 3, uh, which is the precursor to chapter 4, I thought I'd share that's a very deep thought, chapter 3. But chapter 3, uh, Peter and John come to the temple. Remember from last time? Peter and John come to the temple and they continue the work of Jesus. What did Jesus do? He healed people and he preached the gospel. Basically, he preached himself as the king. That's what Jesus did. And, um, and invited people into the kingdom of God. So Peter and John continue the work like Jesus said his disciples, his apostles would do. They continue his work. So they're coming into the temple, remember, in chapter 3. And, and, the, and there's a man who's been um, lame from birth, uh, it says, crippled from birth. And everybody knows who this guy is. And they say those famous words, you know, silver and gold we don't have, but what we have we'll give you. And they reach down, grab hold of him. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up. Boom, the guy stands up, and he's walking and leaking, leaping, le leaking, walking and leaping and praising God. Remember the song from Sunday school? Yeah. Walking and leaping. We won't sing it right now. That's where this comes from. This guy is amazed he's literally jumping up and down and the rest of the people are amazed by this happens about three o'clock in the afternoon during the time of prayer at our prayer now thousands of people were gathering regularly already in the temple precincts um, and remember the temples the 36 37 acres it's huge and the temple proper they weren't in the in the building they were out in the courtyard this big huge courtyard <clears throat> with uh, Solomon's portico, which had this big cover. It was uh, open on one side, and uh, the acoustics were such that you could accommodate a sizable group. And so there were thousands of people who would meet regularly to hear Peter and John and the other apostles talk about Jesus every day. They did this every day, thousands of people. So when Peter and John heal this guy, and they bring him in to the temple area, I mean, the place is a buzz because there's already a lot of Christians and now they're spreading the word. Hey, go tell mom to close up the shop and come up here. You got to see this guy. This is the most amazing thing. 
It's an exciting time. And he gets an, Peter gets an oppor- another opportunity to preach the gospel, to tell about who Jesus is, to explain to Israel that the Messiah has come, that he's risen from the dead, that, that there's this whole new life that's available. It's, it's phenomenal in chapter 3, you remember. However, remember I said how the light comes into the darkness? And it said in John chapter 1, the light comes into the darkness, the darkness did not overpower it, but it's not for lack of trying. Okay? There's opposition to the work of God, and in the book of Acts, which is a wonderful account of the spread of the gospel in the first 30 years, turn the coin over, and you realize it's also an account of the opposition toward the gospel in the first 30 years. In fact, it starts in chapter 4, where the opposition against the light, and the opposition against the gospel starts to, starts to happen. And if you don't expect opposition, then it takes you by surprise. So one of the reasons I'm doing this study this morning is so that we are not taken by surprise when it becomes difficult at times to share the gospel and when we discover other people don't want to hear it sometimes. Whole cultures don't want to hear it. The, the light of God penetrates the darkness. The darkness doesn't overcome it, but like I said, not for lack of trying. The book of Acts tells the story of the glory of the progress of the gospel. The word of God developed and developed. You can see it clearly, but also the opposition to the gospel. In fact, even in the last chapter, the last couple of paragraphs of the last chapter of Acts, Acts 28, there are people, Jewish leadership in Rome, who absolutely try to shut Paul down. Some of them do. And he says, we're going to the Gentiles. They will listen. There's opposition all the way through the book. So as we look in chapter 4, and we're going to do the first uh, 22 verses of chapter 4 of the book of Acts, I'm doing it under this heading. It's the heading of the annoying truth of the gospel. And it comes from the first couple of verses we're going to read because it annoyed these people. It annoyed the leadership of Israel. Not the common folk, but the leadership. They were annoyed. They were bothered. They didn't like it. And so the, the what, I'm gonna, what we're going to see as we work our way through it is, first of all, the resurrection really bothered them and really annoyed them. And we'll see that in the first six verses. And then the gospel of grace bothered them, and there were reasons why they didn't really think they needed grace. And they didn't like the idea that there's only one name under heaven whereby we must be saved. See that in verse 12. And then the confidence, the third thing we'll see in this through verse 22 is the, uh, the odd and astonishing confidence that these common people have because they understand who Jesus is. They have a, a, a power and a confidence within them, the apostles, and it astonishes and bothers and frustrates the leaders of Israel. Let's begin in uh, Acts chapter 4. Verse 1, as they were speaking, now this is breaking into the events of Acts chapter 3. Peter is there, it's, uh, he healed a guy uh, around 3 in the afternoon, <clears throat> and then by the evening time, he had been preaching, and more and more people were there, thousands really. And uh, so while he's preaching, the chief priests, the Sadducees, people who run the, the temple, these are the people who run the temple, Um, They come up. As they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. They were telling people that there's a resurrection and and one person has been resurrected right now in the middle of time. And this just blew everybody's mind. And they arrested them. They put them in custody until the next day for it was already evening, and they arrested all three of them, Peter, John, and the guy who was walking and leaping and praising God. He got arrested too. But many of those who had heard the word, by the way, in the book of Acts and most of the New Testament, whenever you hear the phrase, the word of God, it's almost always a reference to the gospel itself, okay? And and especially when Luke talks about it, it's the word of God, it's the gospel spreading. And he says, but many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. Now, whether this is 5,000 on top of the 3,000 that were already saved in Acts chapter 2, or whether it's a total of 5,000, it doesn't matter. The Greek word for men here is the word for males versus females, 
And so there's a bit of speculation among the thinkers who work with the text. Did he mean just the men? Because if he did, then there would be probably at least an equal number of women, maybe more. That would make it 10,000 plus kids. I mean, this is a phenomenon in the, in the city of Jerusalem. And, and they're in the midst of this. There were several thousand people listening at the time that these things took place and these guys have to come arrest them. I mean, if you're working for the Sadducees, wouldn't you be thinking, am I gonna start a riot here? Because the Jews, were, were, they were known for taking up arms against the Romans and against their leaders sometimes. And so it would have been a tense moment with these guys coming to arrest Peter and John. But they did it. But there were thousands of people who came to the Lord. By the way, you know, this invisible, I'll talk more about this as we go along. I'll tip the hand a little bit here. There's this invisible reality going on when it looks dark in the world. It looks like, it looks like oh, well, this is terrible what's going on here. These, oh, no, they're being arrested. But 5,000 people have, maybe 10,000 people have come to Christ. So there's this invisible thing in the angels and the, and the Lord and in the invisible realm. They're just scooping people into the kingdom of God scooping thousands of people out of the darkness and into the light. And yet it looks like it's going the other direction. Uh-oh, we offended the elite systems of the day. Note the opposition now. They were annoyed at the resurrection. They were bothered by the resurrection. On the next day, their rulers and the elders and the scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest. Remember him from uh, the crucifixion of Christ? Annas was the power behind the throne. He was the, one might call him the high priest emeritus. They call him the high priest here, but he's really the retired high priest. But he has all the power. He has enormous influence and power. And his son-in-law is Caiaphas. Do you remember his name from the last days of Jesus? These are the two guys who were, Caiaphas especially, he was in charge at the time Jesus was crucified. He was behind, behind it. So bear that in mind when Peter, Peter preaches to these guys. Um, bear that in mind. These are the guys whose thinking and whose actions were behind the crucifixion of Jesus himself. And John and Alexander, we don't know much about those guys. And all who were of high priestly family, and they set them in the midst and they said, so this is a Sanhedrin kind of gathering <clears throat> in one of the main buildings. And they set a Peter and James, I mean, uh, Peter and John, and whoever the guy was who got uh, healed, he's there. And they said, by what power or in what name do you do this? What in the world are you doing? Where'd you get this authority? I mean, you know, what are you representing here? Because you're not representing us. It's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Notice that that's what is annoying them. This is what's bothering them. And it always is the resurrection of Jesus. It is this miraculous reality that Jesus Christ, Jesus is the Messiah, proven by the fact that he came back from the dead. Um, now notice that these are Sadducees. Now there were two, actually there were four main groups, basically, within Israel. Two of them were not well represented in Jerusalem itself. The Essenes were out in the desert fasting, and the uh, Zealots were hidden. They were kind of an underground group. But the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they're, they're, they're well known. And the, the reason it annoyed them about the resurrection is that the, the Sadducees, who ran the temple, by the way, all the priests were Sadducees. The captain of the temple guard was a high caste Sadducee. He was a Levite a high caste Sadducee. Uh, they ran the whole temple function and they didn't believe in resurrection at all. And that's, uh, that's why they're upset. They, it just isn't in their theology. One of the reasons is that they didn't believe the writings of the Old Testament. They believed only the Torah, only the first five books. But you could see it there anyway. Jesus pointed it out to them. I'm not, you know, the, God the Father is not the God of the dead but the God of the living. <laughs> And the, there is life after death, and there is a coming resurrection. But the Sadducees denied that. They denied the existence of angels. They denied the invisible realm. Kind of rationalist, religious professionals. They were also very connected to the Romans. They had a vested interest in the status quo. They did not want to see a rebellion on the part of the Jews. Because if the Jews rebelled against Rome, there would be a destruction, which actually happened. Jesus predicted it. It did happen within one generation. 
So this, this group is upset about the resurrection because they don't believe in resurrection. By the way, by the way, do you know that when you come to the Lord Jesus Christ, you had better let go of the worldview that does not include the invisible realm? You've got to let go of that worldview. There are angels. There are demons. There is resurrection. There is not only just spirit life after death, but material life after death. Furthermore, there's death after life. That's a whole other story. There's a thing called the second death. When you come to the Lord, what you're saying right up front is, I'm entering into a whole different worldview than anything I've ever been taught in this age. And if you're a converted believer, if you're a genuine believer in Jesus, you might want to check the mental file on those subjects. Because this concept of resurrection is earth-shattering to the Western world. It's earth-shattering. If you really believe it, it puts everything else in perspective, a different perspective. Now, the Pharisees also were upset with this, though. Even though the Pharisees believed in a coming resurrection of everybody, um, Daniel chapter 12 talks about a resurrection, a general resurrection at the end of time. They believed that. They believed in angels. Pharisees believed in angels. They believed uh, in life after death and all that. Uh, but they did not believe that someone could be resurrected in the middle of time, one person resurrected in the middle of time. That they did not believe. They couldn't understand it. It was new. It was something they had never even considered might even happen. But that's what happened. And that's why when Peter preaches the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that it already happened, and then he tells other people that if they'll trust Christ, they too will be resurrected when, after they die. The Pharisees don't like it either. So the Sadducees and the Pharisees, who didn't agree on very many things, agreed that they didn't like this preaching. By the way, the Pharisees were the people who worked in the synagogues, not the temple. The temple was the Sadducees' property there in Jerusalem. The synagogues were spread out throughout the, uh, throughout the country in the different towns. That was where the Pharisees did their teaching, and they believed the whole Old Testament, and they tried to keep all the laws and everything. It was a slightly different group. But their view of resurrection set them apart from the Christians. The Christians were saying, the Messiah has come. He has been resurrected. And by the way, FYI, when Paul comes on the scene, and Paul had been a Pharisee. Uh, he was in the Pharisee group. At the time, these things took place, by the way. He was there. He, he was in on this, on the wrong side. Okay? But later, after he gets converted, he takes the message of resurrection to the Greeks, to the, to the Gentiles. And guess what they said? The same thing everybody else said, we don't like it. We don't like the resurrection for a whole different reason. They believed that uh, you don't want to have a resurrection body. That's going backwards in time. <laughs> you, don't, you don't want to have a body. You want to be pure spirit. Join the great Eck consciousness. Become a part of the great world consciousness. Whatever. They didn't want to have an individualized, material, resurrected self. They thought it was unspiritual. It was unphilosophical. Nobody liked the resurrection. It annoys people. And we'll see more about it in just a minute. And to this very day, it is still the resurrection that sets the gospel apart from every other religion. A theologian that I'm aware of, don't know him personally, but he tells a story of a discussion he had with a Muslim imam. It was a peaceful discussion in public. It was a... Uh, uh, not a debate so much as a discussion, really. Just what, uh, what's the difference between Islam and Christianity, just for people to get an idea of what the differences are. And after they had talked about this, because Islam is, is radically uh, moralistic and monotheistic. And um, after they had discussed a bunch of different things, the Muslim imam said something interesting. He said, you know, you and I, we could cooperate on a huge number of things if only you would let go of this idea that Jesus came back from the dead. Which is why in the culture that we live in, you can produce unity as long as you don't talk about Jesus coming back from the dead. As long as you don't talk about him being the only name under heaven whereby we must be saved. As long as you don't talk about this mutual, exclusive, universal promise of salvation through Christ alone. As long as you don't say any of that stuff, Religion can get along just fine. So that's why to this very day, the issue is the resurrection of Jesus. When you share the gospel with people, do you include the resurrection? I hope you do. Well, I'll give you some advice on that at the end of the sermon. This is the third service, so I can preach until 2 o'clock <clears throat> or something. 
I'll give you some advice on it, but I'll tell you up front, um, part of the, not part, at the heart of the gospel is the fact that Jesus came back from the dead. When you tell anybody about Jesus, you have to tell them. He died for our sins. He came back from the dead. He's the risen, living Lord of the universe right now at the right hand of the Father. And that will set you apart. I mean, it will really clarify the issues with anybody that you talk to. And it only takes a couple minutes to say that. It's amazing. Is that really true? I mean, do you really, do you, <laughs> am I putting too fine a point on it to ask you if you really believe this as a Christian? Do you know this truth? Do you, do you rest in the resurrection of Jesus Christ that because he's resurrected, you cannot not be as a Christian? Once you put faith in him, it's impossible for you not to be resurrected? Do you, do you see that as your destiny? Do you see that as the thing that gives perspective to your life? And is at the heart of the preaching of the gospel. Okay, so the first thing we see here is that they're annoyed by the resurrection. And the next thing is they are bothered by the gospel of grace. Because Peter, when he tells them that you can be saved by Jesus, they don't want to hear it. So they say, what's the power you did this miracle? And Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. By the way, the Bible relates, the, the New Testament relates different fillings of the Spirit depending on the need of the moment. And I would encourage you to trust the Holy Spirit to fill you to do whatever he calls you to do at any given time. Okay? It's not just once and for all. You're in the Spirit the minute you come to Jesus. But then he fills you for various things at different, at different times. And you should trust that. And it says he was filled with this. Was he not filled before this? No, he was. He was walking with the Lord. Spirit was in him. He was in the Spirit. But then there was this special anointing for him to do what he needed to do at this moment. And Peter was filled with the Spirit, and he preached. And he said, rulers and people of the elders, and the elders of Israel, is what he's talking about. If we are being examined today concerning a good deed, like, what are you complaining about? By the way, am I talking too fast? Okay. Third service. <clears throat> um, if we're, I want you to see how a little bit snarky. He's being a little bit snarky. Like, are you guys upset with us for healing a guy? Come on. What's wrong with this? The people love it. This guy loves it. He's walking and leaping and praising God. They're going to write a really cool song for the kids in the future about this. What are you worried about? Why are you picking on us about healing a guy? He's kind of, that's what's coming across a little bit. He says, if we're being picked on or examined by, uh, because of a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, then not, let me tell you how. He says, let it be known to all of you and to the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, ooh, once again, Peter does not miss an opportunity to explain who killed Jesus. But don't think it's just the Jews. Caiaphas was there. Caiaphas and Annas and the other people who voted and have conspired against Jesus. These guys, not that long ago, had been having their secret meetings. How are we going to kill Jesus? They remembered this. And Peter looks right at him and says, you did this. And people say, well, yeah, it was the Jews that did this. Well, yes and no. Did they not represent all of humanity? And were the Romans not complicit in it? And if we're, if we're Gentiles, are we not complicit in it? Of course we are. What he's saying is, you have to admit that you've been God's enemy. And when you admit that, then he says, now I can make you my friend. But these people still would never admit that they had been God's enemy. He says, but you did. You killed Jesus of Nazareth, whom you crucified, and whom God raised from the dead. See, there's the resurrection again. We're not backing off on it, he says. God raised from the dead. By him, this man is standing before you well. And this is huge. This crippled man, a living witness, a changed, healed life is a living witness to the person of Jesus. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men, humans, by which we must be saved. 
Now what he's offering them, even though it is stinging, it's stinging for them to hear this, but what he's really offering them is salvation. He says it twice. He uses the, the term for salvation twice here. He's offering them grace, the same way he did in Acts chapter 2 and in Acts chapter 3 and throughout all the preaching. He's offering them grace, and he's saying, there isn't, you can't find this in Judaism. You will not find forgiveness in these other religions. This is the gospel of grace. And it is deeply offensive to them. Um, and also what's offensive is what he's saying to them is that here they, they're the people of Israel and when the cornerstone was presented to them, they rejected him. And you know where that comes from? It comes from Psalm 118. I want you to turn back and look at it for yourself. Psalm 118. Uh, verse 22. Now see, the people he's speaking to, that Peter's speaking to, they would understand this verse. They would understand it as messianic, and they would probably say, we would never do that. <clears throat> but they are the ones who did it. In Psalm 118, 118, verse 22, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This verse is used several times in the New Testament to refer to Christ. Because he was rejected. Remember in John chapter 1, uh, where it says he came to his own, his own received him not, but it to an, as many as did receive him, he gave the right to become children of God, born of the Spirit, not of men, and so on. Um, what's happening is rejection on the part of Jesus. Uh, I'm on the part, Israel rejecting Jesus. And yet he turns out to be the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, verse 23. It is marvelous in our eyes. See, the people had sung this and thought they were on the right side of things. This is one of their hymns. They, they would sing it, and they thought they were on the right side of it, and what Peter is saying is you're on the wrong side of it. You actually are the builders who rejected the cornerstone. What a, I mean, that's hard. That's difficult for these guys to, get, to grasp. Look how they have to admit they've been wrong all along. When you tell people they've been wrong, they don't like it. <laughs> There's opposition to it, see. Uh, it's marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Did you know that's where that verse was? People know the verse. Did you know it's in Psalm 118 and that it's a messianic piece? Save us. That's the word Hosanna in the original. All of the Hosanna songs come from this. And this is what they cried out before they crucified Jesus a week before at the uh, triumphal entry. They quoted this same psalm Save us, we pray, Lord. Oh, Lord, we pray, give us success. See, early on, they thought Jesus was going to do this. They didn't realize it was success much deeper than what they thought they needed and a salvation much deeper than what they thought they needed. He is really the cornerstone. He really is the one upon whom, if you build your life, you'll be building on the rock. Amen? Amen. Okay, so he's telling these guys, and they don't want to hear it. He's saying, you've actually rejected the Lord. Let's go back to Acts. A lot of times people will listen about Jesus and reject and reject and reject and reject for a long time. And then they come to the conclusion, you know what? I have rejected him for the wrong reasons. I, I should have listened to him. I should have built my life on him. So he's quoting this psalm um, <clears throat> kind of offhand referencing it. He doesn't quote it. He doesn't tell them to look it up. They've got it memorized, most of them. They, all, they know what he's talking about. And then he says, and there is salvation in no other name. So the gospel of grace bothers these guys, largely because they don't think they need the grace. They think they're representing God effectively. And Jesus consistently told the, the, the Jewish uh, leadership that they were not representing God uh, that he himself was representing God, and it was one or the other. couldn't have been both. Um, so once again, they are annoyed. They're annoyed by the resurrection. They're annoyed by the gospel of grace because they don't think they need it. And they're also amazed by the, by the confidence these people have and the fact that they can't shut them up. It bothers them. That It frustrates them that they can't shut these Christians up. Verse 13, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished. Now, uneducated doesn't mean stupid. It doesn't mean they didn't know what they're talking about. The exact opposite is true. 
They knew exactly what they were talking about, and they spoke of it eloquently. This is what astonished the academics. The academics, and it was a small number, really. You didn't, they didn't have kind of education like we have. The academics were at the top of, the, of their pyramid, and they looked down on, on everybody else. Um, Peter and John, all of the apostles, um, were smart people, and they had... It's just that they weren't part of the educational elite, and that's what's astonishing them. It says common men, and they were astonished. That, um, I shared this in the second service. I didn't share it in the first service. But um, some people will look at this and they will say, um, what does it mean common men? Actually, the Greek word, don't tell anybody, okay? but the Greek word is idiotes. <laughs> it doesn't mean idiot. In Greek, it, the word idiot comes from this Greek word. But in their world, what it meant was amateurs. These are amateurs. That's all it meant. Um, if you are not perceived as a professional to some people, they won't listen to you. And that's what astonished these leaders. They're going, these guys are speaking with profound confidence. They actually have more confidence in what they're saying than we have when we quote each other back and forth to each other. And that's exactly what they said about Jesus. It was a confidence born of real knowledge of the Lord. It says here that they, they realized that they had been with Jesus. Sometimes people will read this. I've heard this said. I've actually had it said to me. Well, you don't need any education if you want to serve the Lord. Because look, at these guys were uneducated common men. You don't really need to go to learn anything. And I tell folks... That's not what this verse means, but let me just ask you a question. Are you fluent in Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic? Because these guys were. Oh, oh no, I only speak English and I don't even speak that very well. Yes, I realize that. Yeah. Uh, did Jesus tutor you personally for three and a half years before his resurrection and then after his resurrection, tutor you again as the resurrected Lord for six weeks? Did he do that for you and teach you about the... Well, no, not really. Well, then perhaps you should learn from some other Christians and not think that you don't need any education. These guys, when it says uneducated, it doesn't mean stupid, and it doesn't mean what they, they didn't know what they were talking about. It means exactly the opposite. They had been tutored by Jesus. They were doing miracles in Jesus' name. Oh, yeah, by the way, do you do that? You know, friends, don't think for a minute that these men were not bright and smart and articulate. They were amazing guys. Even though we sometimes look back on how they grew and we look back and go, yeah, they made some mistakes earlier. But by the time this has taken place, these guys are a powerful voice directly for the Lord into the world. So, and this astonishes the leadership because they're not part of the elite. They're not part of the, uh, the educational elites. Seeing that the man who was healed standing beside them, see, he's there with them, they, they had nothing to say in opposition because <laughs> what can you say? He's jumping up and down still from yesterday. And when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another. What are we going to do with these guys? Verse 16. A notable sign has been performed through them. And this is evident to everybody in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. Implication? If we could deny it, we would. If we could get away with lying about this, we certainly would, but they couldn't. Too many people saw it. Okay, so, but in order that it may spread, no, what's it? We don't want this to, it to spread any, what's the it? Circle it, what's it? It's the gospel, it's the message of Jesus as the Lord. Now, take note, it's not the miracle of healing the guy. The miracle was a powerful miracle, but miracles by themselves do not produce faith in Christ. They authenticate in the book of Acts especially, and throughout history, God has done miracles many times. They authenticate things, but it's the preaching of the gospel that converts people. It's the message of Jesus. The miracle by itself wouldn't have done it. People would have said, that's amazing. God must have done that. But Peter brings perspective to it. He says, no, 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 no. That's not all there is to this. Jesus is the Messiah who came back from the dead. That message converts people. So, <clears throat> they, they, it, we don't want it to spread <laughs> among the people. So <clears throat> let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. Well, that's going to be uh, 
Ridiculous thing to tell these guys. So they called them, charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. And Peter and John answered them. And notice this is the third snarkiness that you see in Peter. And it's, it's a little subtle, but it's obvious. He's talking to people who are running the temple of God, for heaven's sake. I mean, they're running it into the ground. It's become their personal thing. But they know better. Look what Peter, how they answer. He says, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than God, you need to be the judge. That is a little bit snarky. But we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Courage, the kind of clarity that comes with these guys, comes with the knowledge of God, comes with the knowledge of who Jesus is. The more you know about the gospel, the more confident you will be of it. And that's what this word boldness means that they had in verse 13. It's confidence. It's the ability to communicate confidently. He says, well, we have knowledge of Jesus Christ. We have to say what we know to be true. Peter and John both, both these two apostles, they're right here. They wrote other things, you know. Peter wrote First and Second Peter. In Second Peter chapter 1, he says explicitly, we did not make this up. We saw his glory. He's talking about the transfiguration, but also the resurrection. John says the exact same thing. In 1 John chapter 1, the first four verses, he says, we handled and touched the glory. He's talking about touching the resurrected Lord, seeing the glory. We are not going to not talk about this. By the way, if you want courage, may I encourage you, if you want courage to speak of Jesus, may I encourage you to find out more about him? And keep learning because it is the knowledge, it's this kind of knowledge that brings the kind of confidence instead of just beating yourself up for not being confident. (laughs) Spend some time meditating on who Jesus really is. Take the word of God in. Trust what he says about himself. Let that deepen your sense of confidence. Anyway, these common men and yet trained well in who Jesus is. And they said, we're not going to stop talking. And when they had further threatened them, you can see Peter and John looking at each other, listening to the threats, walking away, looking at each other, rolling their eyes. I'll bet. I'll bet they roll their eyes on their way out. Like these guys think. These guys think they have a better answer than resurrection from the dead? I don't think so. They let him go, finding no way to punish them. They will find a way in the next few chapters, if you read the rest of Acts. They will find a way to punish Christians, but not yet. Because the people, because of all the people, they were all praising God for what had happened. The man on whom this sign of healing was performed was really old. He was 40. (laughs) In those days, lifespans were shorter than ours, and this would have been a very mature man at the age of 40. Um, But the important thing to realize is nobody could have done this except God, and the people, they took Peter's word for it. God through Christ is the one who's done this. So the opposition against the gospel, um, they didn't like the resurrection, they didn't like the gospel of grace, and they were offended and surprised by the boldness and the confidence of the people who knew God. I want to spend the rest of our time just encouraging you to think some things, okay? Things you should think about the gospel, and here's the first one. The gospel is the most important thing going on, bar none. It's more important than COVID-19. It's more important than the riots we see in the streets of our country right now. It's more important than the political issues that absolutely dominate, and I might add, bring fear and anger into the hearts of so many people. The gospel is the most important thing happening on the face of the earth, and this has been true for 2,000 years, ever since Acts chapter 2, ever since Jesus died for our sins, came back from the dead. And what the world does is it gets its mind off of God, off of the gospel, and onto itself tries to solve its own problems and creates more problems. And Christian friend, if I might suggest, without, again, putting too fine a point on it, If you have spent a lot of time uh, fearful and angry about what's going on in our world, may I suggest a refocusing on the spiritual realities of the gospel? Because millions of people are coming to Christ right now. 
And, and when you see people, next time you see a big crowd of people doing anything, ask yourself, I, say to yourself, I wonder what God is doing in the hearts of every individual in that group. Because I'll bet you anything he's doing something. He says, I, every human being knows who I am one way or another. He is working in the hearts of people even when they are in riots. <laughs> and we, we're supposed to focus on the invisible. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 and following, Paul says, focus on the invisible, well, not on the temporal. It helps us to get our heads back in the gospel, get our heads back in the game, realize this is the most important thing going on. This is why we continue to preach. This is why we continue to bring missionaries into the world. This is why we pray for our country in the name of Jesus. Did you see uh, in Seattle after the big violent, the first big violent night, the following morning, a bunch of Christians went to downtown Seattle and started praying. Did anybody notice that? It was in their news up there. But generally speaking, the news will not talk to you about what God is doing. In fact, if you, all you do is watch the news, you would get the impression that the world functions completely without God's intervention. He's not doing anything. You get that impression. There might be religious people in the world, but there isn't a real God dealing with anything. Friend, if you've allowed that to get into your head, get it out of your head. God is at work, and people are coming to Christ out of the darkness into the light. It's invisible, but it's very, very real. Even through this COVID thing, with, uh, with the churches not being able to meet in large groups, which everybody thought that would be the worst thing ever. Um, and it is better to meet in large groups. Don't get me wrong. I'm very grateful we can meet in larger groups again. And I look forward to when we can meet even in larger ones. But the, the internet presence of the churches has increased a hundredfold. Even churches that weren't doing anything like this before doing it. And um, one church in Southern California, Church of 3000, they had a pretty wide viewership, very famous pastor, has written a bunch of books. Um, they went from a, a few thousand people listening to 500,000 people listening and watching on TV. That's really good news. And we've seen it here, not 500,000, Praise God, I don't need any more email, but, um, but multiplied people paying attention who may have been frightened to come to a Christian gathering, but they'll watch. You know, you cannot stop the power of the gospel. So we as Christians need to focus back on that and pray for our country, pray for revival, pray for the ministries, keep our hand on the plow, keep moving forward. Why? Because... First thing to note, it. Remember I had you, I had you circle the word it. And the guy said, we gotta stop it from spreading. <laughs> well, the first thing to note is it is the most important thing happening on the earth. And you get to be a part of it. You're, you're part of this thing. It's wonderful. And the second thing to note is this. It's not always good news to everybody. Um, do you see that here in this passage? And you're going to see it throughout the book of Acts. When you turn the coin over from the positive aspects of the gospel growing and realize there's a negative aspect too where people reject, people oppose. Um, it doesn't sound like good news to some people, the gospel. And you need to know this because sometimes Christians are a little naive. They think, well, this is the most wonderful news. And then they're shocked and angry and frustrated and fearful when they come across people who say, get out of my face, I don't want to know that. And, they, you know, it's like, oh, oh, should I not talk about Jesus now? Let me give you three reasons why people don't want to hear. Number one, religion. Uh, that's the group he's talking to here. These are people who had confidence in their own religious activity. Note, by the way, it is right straight out of the Old Testament, most of it. They had actually taken the religion that God gave them and put their confidence in the religion itself. Now, what does that tell you about all the other religions? See, if Jesus Christ is the Lord who came back from the dead and is seated at the right hand of the Father, then you cannot hide in your religion for any kind of confidence at all. And no, but there are people who do not want to hear that. It's, it's very threatening to find out that all of their religious stuff is not going to save them. It can't save them. So for that reason... If you're talking to a particularly religious person, you can expect that they will be a little uh, unreceptive. 
And be sensitive to it, but be aware. That's one of the main reasons. Confidence in religion is one of the things that people have across the boards, all different kinds of religions and philosophies. And here's another one. It's uh, secularism. Secularism is a philosophy. It's a myth, but it's the idea. Secular comes from the Latin term seculum, which means worldly. And secularism is an ism about how our culture works. It, the term became kind of current in the mid-1800s, but it's the idea that you can live your life on earth as if God doesn't exist. Uh, and our culture is essentially secularized in that sense. You can live your life as if God doesn't exist. Now, when you, if, but now remember, if Jesus Christ, Jesus is the Messiah who came back from the dead and he's the li living Lord of the universe right now and whose name is the only name you can be saved, what does that do to secularism? blows it right out of the water. And people don't like that idea. They don't want the idea of secularism removed from their thinking. Secularism is a complete myth, and if you as a Christian try to lead a secular life six days out of the week and then worship well on Sunday, it will not work. It just doesn't work. Because life isn't secular. God is real. <laughs> life is not secular. And yet, Atheism, agnosticism, we hide under this secularist blanket. <clears throat> and when you speak of Jesus, risen from the dead, true Lord of the universe who's changed your life, let's pretend you're the guy who's, or the woman who's walking and leaping and praising God. And people hear that. You can expect that they will not want to hear it. They, there will be opposition to it. Because secularism allows us to hide. We are sort of ensconced in our own little private autonomy. But if Jesus is the risen Lord, there is no autonomy. And, and this threatens people's hearts and minds. You've got to know that. You've got to be aware of it. The opposition comes from this threat that they feel. And here's the, the third reason is moralism. Moralism is the idea that, he, that humans, and the, kind, the type of moralism I'm using or referring to is the, is the idea, very current in a secular world, that we can create our own moral parameters and live by those and that will be fine. We'll, create, we'll recreate our own definitions of moral reality and that will be fine. Um, our culture is, is just shot through with this idea. And that moralism, in other words, just being good, if there is a God, he'll look at me and go, I'm, I'm perfectly fine because I, I know somebody who's worse than me. And, he must be grading on the curve, and so I'm a moralist, and I'll be okay. If Jesus Christ came back from the dead, and he's the Lord of the universe, seated at the right hand of the Father, that blows the moralism right out of the water, because what it means is you can only be saved by grace. By one name under heaven, whereby we must be saved. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father. In the first service, I said, I quoted it this way. Jesus is the way, the, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and only a few people come to the Father outside of me. And you guys are doing the same thing. You're looking at me like, hmm, are you there? You should be saying to, you should be shaking your head. You should be going, no, pastor, that's not true. What did he say? No one comes to the Father except by me. This this exclusiveness blows moralism out of the water. More, just, just trying to be good and creating good rules for society to live by that you pull out of the thin air without reference to God's law, without reference to God's grace. If Jesus is the risen Lord, blows it out of the water completely. And so this exclusiveness of who Jesus is, coupled with the universal offer, it just strips people's gears. And so there's opposition against it. It helps to know that there's opposition. So, number one, it's the most important thing going on. Number two, it doesn't sound like good news to a lot of people, and you need to be aware of that for these reasons, maybe more. Number three, it is still the power of God for salvation to everyone who hears it, everyone who hears it. Romans chapter 1, 16 and 17, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. And he meant this right here. And by the way, these things took place before he was converted. He was on the scene listening to this. He was on the wrong side of the fence when these things were taking place. He was listening to this. Later, after he gets converted on the road to Damascus, he says, now I am not ashamed of this message because it is the message, it, the it, the thing we're supposed to not <laughs> spread. 
but that spreads like wildfire. It is the power of God for salvation to anybody who pays attention to it, whether they're Jewish or Greek. It's the power of God. It's in your mouth as a Christian. In a fallen world, the dark world we're in, it's in your mouth, it's power. Isn't that wonderful? Don't you think that's a good thing, that you have this in you, that you can speak this to other people, that someone can hear it? and live forever, that person you're talking to, this person could live forever in Christ because you told them this. It is the power of God. It's the most important thing happening. It's not good news to everybody, but it's still the power of God. Let me give you a little bit of advice. Like I told you, we've got plenty of times, third service. <laughs> you want to develop confidence in the gospel, let me give you some advice. Take it or leave it, but I offer it anyway. Number one, you've got to know what the gospel is. A lot of people mix up religious platitudes with the gospel. The gospel is simply who Jesus is and what he did. You hear me say this all the time. I pound it into all of our heads regularly. The gospel is not advice on being good. It's not advice on voting Republican or Democratic. The gospel is above and beyond all of that. It is who Jesus is and what he did. The Son of God who died for our sins, came back from the dead, is seated as the risen Lord. you got to know what the gospel is, and, and, and it helps, secondly, to be able to s- state it succinctly. Can you say it in 20 seconds, 10 seconds, if you have an opportunity to say, this is what it means to be a Christian. This is who Jesus really is. This is what changed my life. I'm walking and leaping and praising God. I'm a person like this. Um, I've been changed by the message of who Jesus Christ really is, and here's what it is. Uh, it doesn't take long to do that. And you know, <clears throat> sometimes people will be a little upset with you. But if you want a little excitement in your life, next time you're in a, a family gathering, you're all sitting around the table, just, just pipe up and say that. By the way, I'm born again. And a, 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 a hush will fall over the crowd. Did I tell you the story of my mom that happened to her? She's with the Lord now, but um, she was a really right-on Christian, and um, she was on a partic- in a particular environment where she was around a bunch of really well-educated, very fine people by all, by all appearances, very fine folks, and it was a table of about eight or ten people at this big table. And um, the, the topic of God came up, And she thought to herself, well, I'm going to go ahead and uh, tell them who I am. And she said, I'm I'm a born-again Christian, and and the Lord is real, words to that effect. Just a real simple thing. And it's like, (coughs) they didn't know whether to spit or wind their watch. And the topic went, well, you know, that's nice, and blah, 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 blah. And then all of a sudden it moves on. Well, after that, a couple of people came and said to her, you know, I've always wanted to meet one of you. Isn't that interesting? You never know when you let on about who you really are, who God might be working in, in that other environment. Because the power of God is there. So you gotta know what the gospel is, you gotta share it in a succinct manner, and and third is you need to expect it to not be received. A lot of Christians are offended and upset and angry and fearful because they, because they're afraid somebody won't receive it. But friends, take a lesson from the book of Acts and from Jesus himself. People won't receive it. Say it properly. Say it meaningfully in the environment in which you are, whatever it calls for. And this was a court scene dealing with Caiaphas and Annas. So this Peter is... Uh, very pointed, and they all understood what he was saying. We are in different environments, but we will come across people who don't want to hear it. And you shouldn't think that you have failed just because a person said, I don't want to hear that. Do you remember, many of you came to the Lord as adults. Do you remember the first time you heard about Jesus and you couldn't get him out of your mind because some Christian shared with you about that? And you couldn't get it out of your mind. But you would never let on to that Christian in those days. That the actual injection had been put into you by someone who spoke the gospel to you. And then later you got saved because once that truth gets embedded in your heart, the Holy Spirit uses it. And I'll get to that in just a moment. See, the initial response that you had 
probably looked like rejection to the first person that shared it with you. So don't be surprised by that. Don't be offended. Don't be angry. Don't be upset. Don't think you're a failure just because there's opposition. Jesus said there would be. And still people come to Christ. That grace penetrates their hearts. And the fourth thing to just take note of by way of advice, you have to trust the Holy Spirit to work. Um, As a pastor for years, um, I have seen it in my own life, and I advise other Christians, do not think that God is not using you just because you shared Christ with somebody and they didn't want to hear it. You have to trust the Holy Spirit to do the converting in people's lives. He's the one who opens people's hearts. Boy, you see that completely among the apostles. They had absolute confidence in that. So, you know, we are, of all people, should be, the most hopeful, the least angry, and the least fearful people in the world as Christians. Why? Because the power of the gospel is really the only hope for our world, no matter how dark it looks. Let's take a moment, just close our eyes, and think this through. Let me ask you, with your eyes closed, have you, are you building on the cornerstone, or is there some other kind of cornerstone you built your life on? Financial success, education, uh, hope in politics, um, some other thing, nationalism maybe, uh, some other thing to build a meaningful life on. You know, Jesus said, if you take seriously what I'm saying, you're building on the rock. Take a moment as a Christian and just say, Lord, would you help me build on the rock, on the on the on the cornerstone? Let let the shape of my life take on the shape of the cornerstone so that the building that is my life will be what the Lord wants. And he'll answer that. And if you're listening to this and you are not a Christian yet, take a moment and say, why am I not a Christian? Why do I not want to build on the cornerstone? Is it for one of these other reasons? You know, Maybe religion or secularity or moralism or self-confidence or whatever. You know, I would encourage you uh, to let go of all that And come to the one who says, if you come to me, I will save you. And my name is the only name under heaven whereby you can be rescued. I encourage you to open your heart to the Lord right this very minute and say, Lord, would you enter my heart? Would you take over my life? Would you, I believe you died for my sins and came back from the dead, that you are the Lord of the universe. I don't understand it all and I don't know very much, but I want to belong to you. He'll take you right this minute. And you'll belong to him forever. And I encourage you to do that. And we have people after church that are up here to pray. Come up and let us pray for you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these things. Let's all stand and pray, as a matter of fact. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these things. We thank you for reminding us of the power of the gospel. Thank you that we, of all people, should be the most hopeful. Um, the ones who, who can be a voice for sanity, spiritual sanity in our world, and who can speak with a boldness that comes from really knowing you. We trust you for these things. We do pray for our country. We do pray for opportunities to share. We pray for all the ministries involved in all the places where there is a great deal of heat and not as much light as there should be. And we pray that you would be glorified in all of it. We thank you, we praise you, we trust you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you. You are dismissed.